And I want you to come back to this. Each time when you look at something, if you're going to do, do school-wide positive behavior support, first, learn the big ideas. Second, be able to identify what are the core features. Third, tell me what you already do brilliantly. And then, right? After you have finished the cheesecake and coffee to celebrate what you do brilliantly, I want you to say, what's the smallest change we could make that would produce the biggest effect? What's the smallest change we could make that would produce the biggest effect? In most cases, defining, teaching, monitoring, and acknowledging three to five positively stated behavioral expectations is the smallest change. All right? Always measure, not just if it's working, but if we're doing it. Too often, we document that things don't work, but they don't work because we didn't do them, right? Or the only thing we did was the sexy piece. We didn't do the actual parts that made it work. So always measure, did it benefit kids and did it really work? Now, here's another way of saying the same thing. Here are a bunch of initiatives. Too often, what we do is we we pretend that we, we create a literacy team, a wraparound team, a math team, a behavior support team, family support team. Got it? Here's what I want you to do with each one of them. What do they do? What are the core features? And what are the outcomes? How do I integrate those so that everything is aligned to student outcomes? The question I want to ask is how does this affect kid outcomes? How does this affect kid outcomes? How does this affect student outcomes? Everything gets tied to student outcomes. And the thing that's great, the thing that I absolutely love about RTI is here are the core features that tie everything together. With RTI, whether you're dealing with early intervention, literacy, math, wraparound, family support, behavior, bully prevention, any of those, start with what's the primary prevention strategy? Too often, we try and do the tricks. Yep, this is one of the slides you don't have. <laughs> Too often, we try and do the tricks without getting the foundation. So part of what I want you to be able to say is, have we actually built the foundation pieces? If in literacy, all you deal with is the number of kids who are failing, if you've got a large proportion of kids who are failing, that typically means your primary prevention strategy is insufficient. Same with behavior. Same with math. Universal screening. Everybody in reading three times a year, beginning of the year, in the fall, in the spring, you measure how kids are doing. I want you to do the same thing with behavior support. October 15, February 15, right? Write these down. October 15, February 15, I want to know what proportion of the kids are behaving in a way that's acceptable. How many of the kids do you have who are whose behavior places them at risk either academically or behaviorally. Academically, because they're not there, they're not paying attention, right? I want you to worry about the kid who is shutting down as much as the kid who is blowing up. So to what extent are we actually set up so that we have multiple tiers of support? Remember, not one, just strategy. If we do things well, if we identify kids who need more support, do you actually know that you can intervene quickly? Can you intervene well? Do you have a way to progress monitor? And do we actually have the organizational systems that will pull things off? Now, in terms of positive behavior support, let me use this as an example. George Sugai, this is a picture of George. Most of you know George. George Sugai actually was raised in Las Gatas, so he's actually from California. Um, he is the person who's primarily responsible for school-wide positive behavior support. His big theme, his big message, his big contribution is take everything that you know about effective instruction and behavior support in the classroom and implement it at the whole school level. If you want to say, what is school-wide positive behavior support? Remember I said talk with clarity? It's a systems framework for establishing a social culture and behavior support so that kids are effective both academically and socially, all kids. So school-wide behavior support is about making schools more effective learning environments. The big theme, right, the thing to take away, the social culture of the school. And the social culture means the extent to which it's predictable, consistent, positive, and safe. Do all children in the school know what the expectations are? When you achieve that, you'll get a more effective learning environment. If you want to look at the research, here's what the research tells us. Invest first in prevention. 
Invest first, whether it's math, reading, behavior, science, whatever, in prevention. Define and teach the expectations. Acknowledge appropriate behavior. And this is a biggie. You all have great debate over if we reward behavior, does that you know, interfere and undercut intrinsic motivation? Basically, the data are unequivocal. That means there isn't any question. The overriding message is that the kids perceive us as being much less positive than we think we are, all right? I mean, if you ask the teachers, how positive are you on a scale of one to 10? The average is 7.3. When you ask the kids how positive the teachers are on a scale of one to 10, the average is 3.2, okay? Now, that difference, that di the, and both groups are experiencing the same thing, the deal is we are under acknowledging what we're, we are being positive. We're just not being positive enough to get the behavior we want. Now, here's the other reason, and, and I really want you to come back to this. In this period of time in our, in our history, I want you to worry about equity. I want you to worry about the extent to which you are making schools not just effective, but effective for the full range of kids. And I'm going to come back to this. The reason I want you to be concerned about establishing clear strategies for acknowledging appropriate behavior is because those kids at greatest behavioral risk are the ones who need it the most. Too many kids come from environments where they are unsure about the behavior of adults. Too often, children in our schools learn to stay away from adults rather than approach adults. Basically, staying away from adults is educational suicide. We actually are worth being around. Part of what I want you to do is I want you to teach kids that schools work and that we are there to help them. I don't want you to be a behavioral cop. I want you to be a guide to success. That's why I don't want you to be just focusing on this is not the right way to do it. I want you to teach her how to do it the right way. That's the real difference. When you walk down a school, walk into a school and watch kids in transition as a teacher walks down the hall. And you all know this, right? You got some schools where all the kids move away from the adults and some schools where kids move towards the adults. Make a school where the kids come to you. Make that happen and you'll do it in lots of different ways. Now here's part of what I want you to be excited about. There are 14,000 schools across the United States that are currently doing what you're doing, 14,000. And if you look by state, those of you who are over 40, you're not going to be able to read the words at the bottom. <laughs> those are states in the United States, and they are in alphabetical order. So here's Illinois, Maryland, Texas, all right? This is the number of schools by state that are implementing school-wide positive behavior support. Here's California. There are about 400 schools in California that are implementing school-wide positive behavior support. Orange County is by far and away the most densely focused. I mean, the training that you all have invested in, the capacity that you've built, you are, in Orange County, an exemplar within the state. You are an exemplar within the state. Now, part of what I want you to worry about is this is the percentage of schools implementing school-wide behavior support. Remember this whole notion of scaling up? Part of what this shows, we are actually working with both of the schools in Delaware. <laughs> but even though, even though we've got over 1,400 schools in Illinois, that really only accounts for about a third of the schools, right? We have one state with over 60%, five states over 40, seven states over 30. We're currently working, remember I said 14,000 schools? There are 92,000 schools in the United States. Our goal is to reach at least half of the schools in the United States before George retires, right? George is getting old, we need your help. <laughs> okay, now, what I'd like you to do is if you look in your hymnal, you will find this page. <laughs> Pull this page out. It is two-sided. Turn it to the side. It says implementing effective practices. Now, here we go. This is, this, is the, um, this is the participation part. 
What I'd like you to do, when you, when you look at, the, at this page, there are, there are 14 functions on one side and eight on the other. This is designed to focus on behavior support and literacy. If you are doing both, fill out both. If you're doing only one, fill out one. What I'm gonna do is for each of the 14 items, I want you to say, are we doing this? Are we doing it sort of, or are we not doing it? Are we doing this? Are we doing it sort of, and are we not doing it? We're gonna go through this fairly quickly, but what I want you to be able to say at the end is, is this something that we are doing? And I want you to use it as a way to say, if we're really invested in RTI, if we're really invested in RTI, to what extent are we making this work? Okay, you ready? Here we go. RTI, regardless of content, starts by saying, do we have an effective and efficient foundation practice? Of one of the big things I want you to take away, you all have seen the triangle, remember the green, yellow, red? Here's the thing I want you to remember. The triangle always starts like this. It always starts with just green. If you're dealing with reading, you're dealing with math, you're dealing with behavior. All kids, all places, all time. Everybody gets the green level of support. Green, yellow, and red, like Barb told us, refer not to children, but to our intensity of support. We start with everybody getting the green level of support. So what does that mean? What does the green level of support mean? Are you ready? And I want you to actually say yes, partial no. Do we have an effective curriculum? So if you're doing early literacy, do we have a phonics-based instruction? Is it scaffold to actually build capacity and competence before you move forward? Do you build the level of fluency before you move to the next pieces? Is it sequenced so that you actually have the, the, the prerequisite skills developed? If you're doing behavior, do we actually have three to five positively stated behavioral expectations? Is it defined within a teaching matrix? And do we have the instructional programs for actually delivering it? Second is, do we, do we actually do it with unambiguous instruction? Do we actually teach well? Part of it is teaching is not just telling. Teaching is actually delivering. So I want you to think. Think, for example, about elementary school. You're going to teach the preposition on. Unambiguous instruction typically looks like this. You give a label. You take the word. The word is on. You give the rationale or the definition. On means that you have two things that are touching and one is over the other, okay? Then you give a positive example. The clicker is on the hand. The clicker is on the table. But part of what we know, unambiguous means you can't do misrules. What I've done so far confuses on with over. So you use non-examples to teach with precision. I want you to have the clicker is not on, the clicker is not on, the clicker is on. The clicker is on, clicker is on, clicker is not on. Good watching, good paying attention. Got it? So, and then, so you have a label, you give the rationale, you show positive examples, you show non-examples, and then you build fluency, right? You build fluency typically with humor, with, feet, with, with uh, competition type things. Okay, is it on? Right, okay. Yeah. So anyway, you, you each have your own way of doing that. You do the same thing with, with, now, so that's with on. Now, what about, do the same thing, apply it. Why don't you teach the concept democracy? Democracy, what's the word? What's the definition? What's an example of democracy? Right, you're gonna say the United States is an example of democracy. That's, that's cute, that's nice. Then you're gonna say, well, what about France? What about Japan? What about Italy? Well, nobody really quite knows about Italy, <laughs> right? And then you contrast it with non-examples. That's how you teach complex concepts with precision. Make sense? Then you're gonna say, okay, here we are, eighth graders, I want you to create a new environment. This is the you know, the unified state of California. What is the critical features, what are the critical features of our government that would make us, as a new nation, a democracy? Define them. See what you're getting at? You build fluency. All right, with behavior support, I want you to do the same thing. Don't just tell me to be respectful. Show me 
what being respectful is, and show me what it is not. So you teach with unambiguous instruction. Do we do that? Do we have adequate intensity? You're going to do early literacy? What have we learned? The data tell us you want to do early literacy, you need a minimum of 90 minutes a day, at least four days a week. If you're doing less than that, right, if you're doing 30 minutes a day, three days a week, that's cute, but it's not going to teach anybody to read. Okay? What about at the yellow part? What about at the red part? All right, reward system. Never teach something you don't acknowledge because part of what you're doing with acknowledging is you're saying that is an example of doing it right. That is an example of doing it right. Especially with social behavior, when you're on the playground and you say that is an example of being respectful, you're teaching a generalized skill. Error correction. All right, here's a biggie. When a student makes a mistake, you say that is not an example of democracy. That is not an example of the Pythagorean theorem. That is not an example of on. And here's the right. You say, that is not an example of what is right. And let me show you what the right thing is. Now practice doing it the right way. With social behavior, what do we say? You are a miserable wretch, and I want you to go to the office right now. <laughs> Seriously, OK? Here's the other thing I can tell you. This is really the most important. When you move up the triangle, when you go from green to yellow to red with literacy, you get smaller groups with greater intensity. One of the reasons you do that is I don't want a reading error to go uncorrected. If I show the letter T and she says K, I'm going to go to the kid next to her and say, what is this? Kid says, T, good. What is this? T. Then I'm going to come back to the kid and say, what is this? T, everybody, what is this? T, great, right? See, we just did the correction because I do not want an error I do not want an error to be rewarded. The exact same thing works for behavior. If I am a mean bully on the playground and I get what I want, I just got what I wanted. That increases the likelihood I'm going to do it in the future. All right, so you're, I want, you now have five marks. Are we doing it, partially doing it, not doing it? Universal screening, to what extent are we building this in? To what extent are we, remember, Two dates, October 15, February 15. I want to know behaviorally. To what extent are kids doing OK? Things you can look for. Office discipline referrals. Part of the thing, if you have more than two major office discipline referrals by October 15, you're typically a player. You can use, you can use standardized measures. You can use the SSBD, the SSRS, the SSBS. There are many measures. Nope, there actually are things called that. The, um, if, you, if this is stuff that's new to you, Kathleen Lane has an absolutely superb book that walks through universal screening measures. Here's a piece of data that um, actually has not been published that Jennifer Frank, Kent McIntosh, and Seth May did. These are data from 325 elementary schools. You ready? Now, I know you're getting a little restless. Coffee's going to kick here in just a little bit, but we've, we've got about nine more minutes. When you look at this, see the line at the bottom, the red line? These are 325 schools. The red line is all of the children who had zero or one office discipline referral for an entire year. Zero or one for an entire year. When you look at that line, that says, on average, those thousands of kids, how many referrals did they have in October, November, December, January? See how it's very, very low? All right, that's nice but boring. All right? The middle line, the middle line are kids who had two to five for an entire year. On average, how many referrals did they have? Got it? The line that's going up. Those are kids who had six or more office discipline referrals per year. Six or more. Remember Elliot? Okay? Here's what I want you to look at. By October 15, on average, they had two major office discipline referrals. Now, come on. Too often what we do, too often what we do is we start off, we hope the kids are going to do OK. We go along for a while. About October, we identify that they're having trouble. We start putting things in place. Then these holidays kick in, and everything gets out of kilter. We come back. We gear back up in January. They're still behaving badly. February, we get the behavior plan started. We gear up in March because it doesn't quite work. By April, we think we've got a plan that works. And then in June, we kick in our major plan, which is to hope they get better over the summer. <laughs> All 
Okay, you ready? Here's about RTI says. RTI says we will measure and determine kids who need help early. Two, we will actually, when we know that, do something different. Early intervention. I want 75% of your major behavioral interventions in place before Halloween. 75% of your high-end behavioral interventions should be in place by Halloween. And one of the things that I can tell you, those of you who do yellow level interventions, check in, check out, check and connect, we just did an analysis of the extent to which check, check in, check out, kids do well. Part of what we found is statistically significant differences between whether check in, check out was instituted before Christmas or after Christmas. If it was implemented before, there was statistically significant increase in the likelihood that the intervention would work. All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to assess how kids are doing, I want you to intervene, and I want you to change the slope of that line. Got that, you wrote that down? All right, now, here we go. Building district capacity, part of what I want you to be looking at, a continuum of evidence. Big message is never one strategy. So you always will say, not only what do we do that's green, but if that doesn't work, what is the yellow? Do we have check-in, check-out? Do we have social skills instruction? If we're doing reading or math, if she's not doing well, do I actually know what to do? And have we assumed that that would work? So build the systems. Do you have a, do you, targeted says, do you have a yellow intervention? Nine says, do you have a red level of intervention? 10, you ready for 10? 10 means if you identify a kid who needs help, do you institute help within two weeks? If you identify, it's not good enough to say she's not doing well and we really feel bad. So you feel bad? Okay, that's nice but insufficient. I want you to say what do we do differently and how do we do that the fast way? So one way to do that, think about the triangle. Triangle math, reading, behavior, writing. So primary prevention is the green, secondary prevention's yellow, tertiary prevention's red. What do you have in place? A great audit for you to do is to fill in those boxes. All right, want to keep going. Progress monitoring. If a kid needs more help, to what extent do we actually keep track of how she's doing? Do we increase the data collection? And the more important thing, look at 12. This is, this is a little bit of a gut check. If you collect data, do you actually see it used for decision making? Do you use it to decide the grouping of kids for reading, the support of kids for behavior, the feedback that she's going to get in math. If, do you use the data to identify that she needs focus on word attack or phonemic segmentation? If you don't, if you've got, for example, check in, check out, are you looking at these data? Part of what I want you to worry about, especially, remember that issue of equity? Every one of you who uses the Swiss system You've got, on a regular basis, the opportunity to say, what's the proportion of kids who get office referrals by ethnicity? I want to know the extent to which you look at that on a regular basis. Use the data for decision making. Use the data for decision making. All right, last two. Last two keep coming back to the whole issue of, can you tell me, if you're using early literacy, you've got a name for whatever your early literacy program is. To what extent are you implementing it as it's intended? On a scale of 1 to 100, to what extent are you implementing it? Now, last two minutes, and this is going to be the part that I really want. This goes to the heart of administrators. What I want you to think about is, for administrators, do we actually have a district policy that indicates clear statements of values, expectations, and outcomes? Not just a vacuous, we will do good and the world will be better. As a, as a teacher, can you look at the policy and say, I am being held accountable for creating a school in which students build the academic and social competence to be effective members of our society? Okay? I want you to look at that. Do you actually have the ability to conduct universal screening and progress monitoring? So it's the district's role. Remember that part about evaluation? Where are the tools that you need? And there are lots. There is no one tool that is superior for all people in all places. But you need at least two 
different kinds of measures that are above and beyond your standardized tests. On a regular basis, can you say, how are kids doing? Universal screening. And with behavior, October 15, February 15. With literacy, we typically also start at the beginning of the year, so you do it three times. But do we have the measures? If you have a kid who needs more intense support, is she getting more intense monitoring to be able to tell how we're doing? Recruitment and hiring. There will come a time in the future where we once again are hiring people. <laughs> to what extent, no seriously, I want you to look. To what extent does the hiring announcement for administrators, school psychologists, counselors, teachers, playground supervisors, right? To what extent does it say knowledgeable about school-wide systems of academic and behavior supports? If you don't build that in in the announcement, come on, you're not serious. To what extent are you knowledgeable about school-wide expectations? Annual faculty orientation. This fall, this August, you all will get together. Remember, we have the opening, and the superintendent comes in, makes us all feel like it's not as bad as we thought it was, <laughs> right? To what extent does every administrator and every teacher get a message? Here's the core policy, here are the three things we expect to change over the year, and this is how we expect everything to run. As the superintendent of schools, I expect to walk into a school and be able to say, what are the behavioral expectations? What are the literacy and math development? How do we put that together? Five, just three more. Got one and a half more minutes. Professional development. Too often, we do professional development in a Christmas tree-like format. My cousin is really great at doing a rousing presentation in something, so she gets asked to come in. Don't do that. I want to look at your school improvement plan. I want to know what the three goals are that you expect to accomplish this year. You're going to do one in math, one in reading, one in behavior, whatever, right? Every ounce of your professional development should be tied to that. If you have two or three days, those days should be punctuated the same content with greater intensity so that day one you learn something, you're expected to do it, come back day two, you get built, go to the third one, you get that. We do a lousy job of doing professional development. Coaching. Of all the things that we've learned, we can train teachers, but too often districts are not organized to deliver the coaching support. No one should have a label that says coach. They should have a label that says school psychologist, counselor, social worker, special educator. Coach becomes a portion of their job, but you need to define what that is, and it needs to be a paid part of the FTE. All right? Seven, annual evaluations. When you're evaluated, to what extent does somebody come in and say, you're teaching brilliantly, but to what extent are you also invested in implementing school-wide systems of academic and behavior support? And last, do we recruit individuals with training, coaching, and implementation skills? Do we actually have a way in which we are building the ongoing support to make that happen? Okay, my task, one, I want you to be excited about the content that you hear today. You excited? Yes, okay. <laughs> now, second, not as you go to the different sessions, but I want you to be concerned not just about how you will do it, but how you will implement it at a whole school level. As you think about what you are doing in your classroom, in your building, I want you to be thinking about what you will ask of the district, the county, and the state. This is a great opportunity. Take good advantage of it. I wish you well. Thank you.